I am with Sarah Minnick today, the owner, founder, and pizza maker of Lovely's 5050 out in Portland, Oregon. So happy to have her on. Thank you for being on the show. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing really good. Thanks for having me. Cool. Well, there is this one question that I always love to ask my guests. Sarah, there is no right or wrong answer. What's good dough? Oh, well, let's see. That's an easy one. Good dough to me. I think there can be a lot of different good doughs, especially when you meet different bakers and they have their own versions. Um, it's always interesting to see what they come up with. But for me, good dough is something that's a high hydration, naturally leavened dough that includes, you know, a good amount of whole grains. If it's bread, I'd say I'd go 100% whole grains. If it's pizza, anything 50% or below that, you know, as long as there's over, I'd say 25% is what I consider to be good dough. Let's go ahead and talk about the dough because I, I saw this Instagram post of yours and you were doing sourdough cinnamon rolls per your kid's request. And one of the requests was no whole wheat, but you said you snuck in 20%. <laughs> I think that my kids, you know, it's the sort of classic thing where kids re rebel against their parents. And mine have a rebellion against whole grains. I fully expect them to come around as adults and sort of see the benefits and, and also just taste the differences there. But it's funny because I'm trying to think of something where I would have made them something whole wheat they didn't like. But I can't really think of anything that like traumatized them. But I think in just in general, it's better if they think that the whole wheat is on the sort of lower side of things. I don't really know why. It could just be full like rebellion or it could just be that, you know, they actually do want things like cookies and cinnamon rolls to be white flour. I personally just think that's very boring and usually it's stuff more delicious to have some sort of whole grain in there. And I usually just am like, okay, just 20% guys, like we're going to have 20% and you won't even notice. It'll just be better. But they seem to think that, that that's untrue. So we have... Uh, Camas Country Mill and Eugene here, and they grow all different grains. And one of the grains that they grow is a white hard wheat, and it's very bright white. And they think that they try to use that in like school cafeterias and things like that, where they do whole grain breads and whole grain, you know, buns and things for sandwiches. And so that the kids are a little bit tricked into thinking that they're whole, that they're white flour. Which I mean, I, it's funny. There's a real stigma against whole wheat that you run into. And again, I'm just not really sure where that comes from because whole grains are just so much better. I think probably what happened is, you know, whole grains have a very short shelf life and probably many times people experience them when they're like expired or gone rancid. And that has given them an idea that it's, they're not as good as white flour, which will hold forever and has a clean flavor and you never taste anything different. But when if you can mill it or use it in its lifespan, which is pretty short, I think, like maybe three weeks or a month, then I think you can just experience the really delicious like qualities of it. I make pizza myself. And why do you think we just naturally go towards the white flour first? Did you go towards the white flour first? And then discover whole wheat or whole grains. How is your progression and how do you how do you view it that way? Yeah, I mean, I I was never, I don't think I'd ever even made bread or dough until I was about maybe like 35. And so I am in 40, 46 now. And I actually taught myself to bake from the Tartine Bread Book. And so, you know, in that book, it has 20% whole grain. I did associate just beautiful like bulls and country bread with having a little bit of whole wheat in it. But that's certainly not how I grew up. I mean, like we have a lot of bakeries in town in Portland and they were pretty much exclusively white flour. There might be like the one loaf that had some whole grains in it or something, but it would be like off to the side designated like whole wheat. And a lot of times I would just have like maybe 30% whole wheat or something like that. I never really had much against it. I just think I didn't have a lot to choose from and it wasn't like offered. To. But once I started to do the tartine bread and that was just really my first experience with learning how to ferment and bake things working with high hydration. I mean, that that really was some of my favorite bread, for sure. That just has 20%. I still, of course, do like the Tartine Country Loaf and those styles. But for me, if I'm actually going to eat something as a meal, I make a really a whole grain pan loaf that I just eat every morning for breakfast. It has tons of nuts and seeds in it. And like the more stuff in there, the more nutritious, you know, qualities that it has are the ones that I think taste the best and that I like to eat the most. Are you looking to make the most 
delicious pizza? Well, listen up because I have an important message for you. A lot of pizza makers are using the wrong type of olive oil for their dough. Let me explain. Using commodity olive oil can have a detriment to your pizza, and I'm talking about a huge one. Whether it's rancidity or a nasty smell, you don't want that on your masterpiece. Say goodbye to commodity oil and say hello to Cordo Olive Oil. Cordo Olive Oil is the ultimate choice for pizza makers like us. Why? Because they use quality olives, they harvest it at their peak, and they store it securely so that when you purchase the olive oil, it is fresh. Cordo Olive Oil is the ultimate choice for pizza makers like us because they pick their olives at their peak, they harvest it, and they secure it in a safe way. That way, it's ready for you when you make your purchase. The choice is yours. Do you want an explosion of flavor? Or do you want that nasty, bitter taste on top of your pizza or in your dough? Anytime you need some Cordo Olive Oil, use the link in the show notes or DM me, and I'll send you that link personally. I appreciate you for supporting me and my show sponsors. That being said, for pizza, uh, our dough right now is about 40% whole grain. And I do think that's a good balance for pizza. So I'm not, I'm not totally against white flour. I, I think that it has its place. But I certainly do think that whole grains are more interesting, at least put in some high percentage into most things, cookies, cakes, and bread included. And I just think that we've lost some of the ideas of what is good about whole grains and it's that usually they're grown on a smaller scale and they just have a really wide variety of flavors. I have a little mock mill and I'll get various grains from a mill or canvas country mill and also just local farmers who grow very small batches of things. And one of my favorite things to do is just get, we have one farm that grows um, spring red wheat and they just grow it on this really small scale. And I love milling that and making cookies with it the flavor. And it's just, they're very tender. They're very delicate. They're very light. I think all that stuff can be achieved with whole grains. It's just a matter of getting your hands on the right ones and using them the right way. And so I called them. Canvas Country is originally a seed farm for, I think, a very long time, generations, maybe you know, 70 years or something like that, have grown seeds and sold seeds. And so this is sort of new to them to be doing the flour and different crops like that, growing and milling flour. And I called and I think they just had, you know, family run business. This woman answered the phone. Hello. I was like, is this campus country? Mill? <laughs> they were, yes. And I was like, I really just have, up in Portland with a pizza place. And I really want to try this flour, the Edison wheat. And she's like, oh, we're, we're totally sold out. We actually just sell all of that to this place in Denver. And I was just like, oh, and they're like, maybe next year we would have enough for you. I was like, okay. Well, what else do you have, you know? And they're like, we have these, you know, make three or four flowers, whole grain flowers, and we are, you know, trying to expand them. And we could maybe, maybe bring you some, but we mostly drop off at like some other bakery that used it. And we probably wouldn't deliver. You'd have to come meet us at that bakery and load it from our truck. And I was like, what if I ordered like a lot of it? Like, you know, I had a big order and they're just like, okay, I guess we could bring it. So I think they, brought, <laughs> they like hard red spring wheat which we still use and did end up and has ended up being one of my favorite pizza flours and bread flours and then just like i added that into our pizza dough at 20 percent, you know because i learned off that tartine country loaf which is 20 percent whole grain so i thought well immediately we can have 20 percent with no problem at all and that was really good i thought 20 percent whole grain no brainer like nobody even noticed i just thought it was better it fermented better it was sweeter and so i was using i think like 80 percent at that point we used the central milling i think we used like the beehive or something like that but I, i've since switched it to artisan baker's craft and also just a touch of the high mountain high gluten the 40 percent whole grain is made up of camas country flowers which is spelt hard red wheat and hard white wheat so there's three different of those i thought about like paring it down because it's so annoying to have five bags of flour when you're mixing a pizza dough but each flour has like has a role and it took me a while to get to that group of flours but i think now each one is pretty important and even those spelts in there at like six percent or something when it's missing if we run out we're sort of subbing in a different one you really miss it for the flavor. And then the white wheat allows us to add a good amount of whole wheat and keep the the, cut, the crust bright. And then I love the hard red spring just for the flavor. And like I said, it adds a lot more sweetness. I think it just keeps the starter and the sourdough a little happier in producing like a lot of lactic acids. Now that I've sort of settled on that, it's been the same for a few years. I don't foresee anything changing in that in that rate. I love how you said every flower has a role. You were talking about sweetness, um, flavor, kind of just promoting strength. Are there any other roles that your flowers um, do for your dough that you didn't list off? I, I don't like in general, like reinforced flowers or high gluten flowers, but I did add in the high mountain and that right now I think is in it like 
maybe 20%. And sometimes I think about getting rid of that, but I think it does add a little bit of extra crispiness. We don't have many, any problems with dough strength and I've got my starter pretty dialed in. I think some, you know, the beginning when you're le learning how to use sourdough, you can like use too much or keep it too acidic. And then it's, it does like destructive things to the dough strength and stuff. But that, that stuff's pretty much been dialed in now for me. I mean, I, we just, I just don't have those problems anymore because I just had figured out how to manage the fermentation better. So, I mean, and I, and I love ABC just for a great basic white flour. This is very utilitarian. You know, Central Milling is, it's not a small operation, but they do their batches, their lot batches. The only thing that does change a lot with those, and probably the Camas country too, is that we have to adjust our hydration a lot just based on different lots of flour that we get. So you really have to watch that. And it's always a little bit of a few days of adjustment when those when those things change. Just for clarification, when you are adjusting things based off hydration, depending on the lot size, are you, is it just based off touch? Are you using anything else to measure that? Yeah, it's the full cycle. Um, I just think the dough struggles a little if it's too dry. Of course, like you don't want too wet because that can just be pretty difficult to work with and never and have a hard time just cooking all the way through and having all the moisture cooked out. So what I notice is that the crust just doesn't bloom as beautifully and evenly if the hydration is a little dry. Also, the first few you know years when I made pizza, the hydration was really low. It was like 75. I mean, that's not low for, for pizza. It can be a lot lower. But right now we were at like 83, 84 percent. And it's not hard to work with. It's just like a pretty perfectly workable dough. It's probably wetter than some, but you know, it's it's more of a bread hydration, I'd say. Are you the only one making pizzas uh, at your restaurant at the moment, or do you have a team? Um, I hear from pizza makers or just business owners that. They try not to make the dough, I guess, too wet, or they make sure that it's manageable because it's harder to train staff. But I also hear that with whole wheat, you can up the hydration a little bit more because the flour just soaks up more water. And so I guess going back to the question is, are you the only one making the pizza or do you have other people making it too? You know, for the past two years in the pandemic, I did make every pizza. I think I think I made about in exactly two years, it was over 30,000 <laughs> pizzas. And that was just being open three days a week. So it was a lot. But now I do have two other people. Usually it's just me and one other person at Lovely's when we've been open making pizza just to keep the consistency. And we were only open six days a week. And I worked four of them and the other person worked two of them. You know, and we sort of just made it work. But I mean, I, I have a kitchen staff of three at a time. Usually someone's doing salads someone's making pizza and someone's cooking pizza. But now there are two other pizza makers at Lovelies and they're great. Um, one of them has tons of experience and she's worked with me for years and made pizza before the pandemic. And so she's back making pizza. And my favorite people to hire, I think it's always good to have seasoned cooks in the kitchen, but a lot of times they don't usually, they haven't applied at Lovelies like historically. So the, the latest person I hired has been a baker and those are really good pizza people. I think they can keep a real handle on the dough. They have a sense that the dough has like, you know, you have to watch it constantly adjust, you know, not so much adjusting the making of the dough, but just after you ball it, like depending on the weather and where you keep it, you have to put some in the fridge, leave it all out. I mean, those sort of sensibilities are key to a pizza maker. I think any baker could learn how to put toppings on and use those efficiently. But I think the real key is some experience with fermentation and just, you know, proofing times and things like that. If you let that get away from you, you know, the pizza won't be as good and you'll also just be struggling with it all night. Like it's overproofed, it's underproofed, you know, it slows you down and it, and then it, it just can ruin your whole night. So I think having those instincts are really good as far as people who make pizza. But yeah, so I won't be making all the pizzas. <laughs> Reopened, we opened for seven days. And I just really, I do need help. I kind of feel like I'm in this new stage where we're going to be open seven days. It's going to be really busy. I have to trust people to be able to help me and make pizza. Lovelies has been open for 12 years. And, you know, many of those years I've been there every day. And I'm trying to get a little more balance going forward. Are you looking to level up your pizza game? If so, I highly suggest that you check out Uni, the unrivaled leader when it comes to pizza ovens. Uni pizza ovens are a total game changer. With the ability to reach up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, you'll have the power to be able to make the pizza of your dreams. What I love about Uni is their portability and versatility. You can bring them anywhere or you can keep them on your patio or in your backyard. And you can make a ton of different styles of pizza with it. They're so fun to use. And guess what? You can use them to start your pizza business too. So whether you're a passionate home pizza baker or a budding entrepreneur, you gotta get with Uni. Use the affiliate link in the show notes. 
That way, you can let my sponsors know that you heard about them through What's Good Dough. Thank you for supporting me and my sponsors. Trust is hard. I mean, when people are over, I make pizza on a small scale, nothing close to 30,000 pies in the last two years. But when people come over for pizza, it's not like I'm asking people to help me push out the dough or top anything. I want them to come out a certain way. Maybe talk about how you plan to, I guess, be more open to other people because I, I don't know. It doesn't seem like you can make a seven day a week business uh, sustainable. I don't know. I don't know your skill set, but it just seems like th- that's a lot for one person. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think like when I think it was key those many years where I worked there every day and, you know, made pizza so many times, you know, just spending so much time there was key to me learning and to getting lovelies to where it is now. Our pizza is really good. And I think at this point, too, I'm more comfortable with saying, like, this is lovelies pizza, you know, and this is how I would like you to do it and how we should do it here. I'm not naturally a boss or someone to be in charge. And so even though I know what I want, I've always felt like a little bad enforcing that on other people and like sort of left room for their creativity. And like, of course, I like their ideas, but I think at this point, I'm kind of comfortable like, well, the pizza needs to be like this, you know, because at this point we have the notoriety, the consistency, the reputation that this is how it is. So I'm just trying to get cleaner at communicating that. I don't think anybody doesn't want to make Lovely's pizzas. But when when I, you know, when we first started out, there's people who come in with pizza experience and they're like, this is how I do it. I mean, I used to work with a guy in the very beginning and we had the fire in the back of them. We had a wood fired pizza oven at the same time. We fired the pizzas along the side. We had apps down the middle and he had just like a little pizza experience and he couldn't stand that the fire wasn't on one side or the other the oven. And um, one night when I wasn't working, he just built the fire on the side. It was like pretty upsetting, <laughs> you know? So I think just as far as that stuff goes, it's like, okay, you know, we can't have anything like that happening. There is a way that we do it. And, you know, just not feeling guilty for asking people for those things, I think. And, and at this point too, I think we have enough of a good reputation. Like people come, they want to do it that way. They want to see how I've been doing it and recreate that. And I mean, we have so many regulars, it cannot be too different. <laughs> people have expectations at this point. You're a boss, Sarah. I mean, like people know who you are from like all over the nation, maybe even around the world for making the pies that you make. And so I feel like you definitely have the authority to be able to tell, you know, some newbie or your existing staff the way you want it. Yeah, I don't think that it's wrong. I mean, so it's funny. I find myself now, and I have like a decade of pizza experience, like working many hours, like very hard. So I think on top of it, to me, that's my biggest qualification. It's like, look, I've put in the time now and the energy and the commitment to it. We have like new servers now and we just opened back up and one of the new servers came back to me the other night and she's like, Table 9 said this is the best pizza crust he's ever had. I can't, he said that. It's wow, what a great compliment. And I was like, yeah, I mean, it's actually like number one. It got voted like one of the two best in the nation, the country. <laughs> like I was like, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying like, yes, this is where we are. But tell them thank you. I really appreciate that. You know, that's that's great. But yeah, no, just I don't, I haven't probably told you where you work, but <laughs> you know, like, we put in the work to be here. Um, I think there are thousands and thousands of excellent crusts and pizza all over the world. And I think that it's really, really fun to see those too. But at this point, I am ready to say like, okay, we put in the work for this and we've earned it. I'm going to try to get you to give your past self you know, advice because a lot of the people who are listening to this right now, they're fairly new into the game. They don't have the notoriety. They don't have the 10 years, but they still have a staff to manage. What would you tell that individual who has to be firm about their dough to others and tell them this is the way to do it without being ceremonic? Yeah, it's a hard balance. I could never say I haven't learned from other people. That's absolutely completely not true. I've learned from just bakers I've worked with who worked at Lovelies. I've learned from, you know, Franco Pepe. I've learned from, you know, master pizza people. I'm not trying to say that by knowing what you want, you don't have like all this room to learn still. Because I mean, I learn all the time from weird sources. I'm always like, okay, wow. You know, my new favorite. I mean, I've always watched that show Pasta Grannies on YouTube. But when I watch those women make pasta, I'm trying to watch like every episode. It's amazing what you can just learn from them. You know, like I'm just that's, that's like my main school right now is just watching Pasta Grannies and gleaning their little tricks. Of course, you have to find the balance of saying, like, this is how I want it, but I'm open to learning. I think the only real way you can get to this 
place is like a lot of experience and a lot of learning and you and traveling around and meeting people and just finding being ready to find those things in unexpected places. And it's not to say that like we don't have off dough nights because that could absolutely happen. And that has happened, you know, many times and will happen forever as long as I have lovelies. But I think there's just this sort of a balance of like trusting yourself, finding what you like, putting in the time and experience and the repetition of making, you know, thousands and thousands of pizza, listening to your customers, listening to your farmers and listening to people that you work with. And I mean, just any source. And so, you know, it, it's hard to give advice. The advice is just keep going, keep learning, keep trying things. And I think like what you're saying, the part of me that's been uncomfortable about being a boss or being in charge is that I do see many people in charge of restaurants and owning restaurants and who are bosses who just like, it's no fun to work for them. You can just tell you're like, nah, that doesn't seem good. There's no learning going on. They're not open to ideas. They just only want people to fall in line. And then, you know, I think it's a mix of like keeping yourself young, working hard, listening. And I don't think there's a shortcut. There's definitely no shortcut. This doesn't mean that early on and owning a pizza place or making pizzas that your pizzas can't be good or interesting. I mean, of course not. But I think as time goes on, you start to hone those skills and figure out what you like and figure out what people like. Because, of course, that is a factor. You can't you don't just serve what you like. You have to listen, you know, to people and what they say. And there's been many times where I've thought I really got this like new crust. I'm going to have 100 percent whole wheat crust. I would make a small batch and I'm going to give one to every regular who comes in tonight. And I would give it. Look, this is like 100 percent Oregon grain crust, you know, and I'd give it to them and it'd be like, no, we don't like it. We like the other crust, you know. And it, of course, I listened because I know that. I need them to be there to support lovelies and come every week. So, you know, it's it's about being humble and also listening to those things. Solid advice because you don't have an ego. You know to continue to adapt. But I love what you said about just having that confidence comes from putting in the work and pushing out hundreds of thousands of dough balls and having the confidence to be able to say, yeah, this is the way it's done, but also keeping your mind open. How's it going, Pizza Pal? I just wanna let everyone know that I started an email list. Why? Because I recognize that time is more important than ever, especially after being a dad. And I realized that content is abundant and sometimes we just can't get to listening to a podcast. And so what I wanna do is send out a weekly newsletter highlighting some of the key topics that we discussed in the podcast. I hope to save you a bunch of time. So please do sign up for this email list. There's going to be a link in the show notes. I truly appreciate it. And I hope I can save you some time. So thank you in advance for signing up for that email newsletter. Well, there you have it. This is part one of a two-part episode. And guess what? Part two is out now. So please go and check that out. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We'll see you at the next one. Hey, home pizza makers, what's good dough? It's time for you and me to partner up together and make pizzas for good. How do we do that? You and I will be doing pizza parties nationwide to raise money for Slice Out Hunger. And yes, it is starting now. So if you want to be a part of my team and make pizzas for good, you can register to be a part of Team What's Good Dough. And yes, it is welcome to all bakers, whether you're just starting off or you're a seasoned pop-up pro. Let's make pizza for good together.